During the Apollo years, the safety standards followed by the NASA engineers who had the final authority for the program was clear and simple. It was a NASA rocket and spacecraft. NASA paid for it, they owned it, and they would make the decision to launch. But they would not launch any vehicle until the contractors were able to prove to them that they could launch and recover the crew safely. The proof we had to provide NASA was found in the lists of options, actions, and details we had accumulated from testing the reliability of every supporting process. If there was an option or action required, it was on the list, and it was practiced repeatedly to be certain of what option or action should be taken in any situation. Every supporting process and line item was routinely subjected to critical analysis by the engineering staff so that when the time arrived to choose an option or action, it was supported by many, many reasonable conversations that had resulted in a clear agreement about the details on the list. This was a reasonable balance of power and ethical restraint that we could all live with, and it worked. NASA launched and recovered six successful moon missions and salvaged a seventh attempt, Apollo 13, which many believe was an even greater accomplishment. But by the morning of the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger, NASA's attitude about flight safety had changed, and not for the better. They had evolved in their thinking to a much less demanding standard, essentially saying, NASA owns this vehicle, and we'll launch it when we want. The job of the engineers for the various contractors had changed from proving that they could launch and recover the crew safely to proving it could not a significant change in NASA's management values, which made the program dangerously vulnerable to a terminal defect. On January 28, 1986, notwithstanding the now well-documented protests from respected engineers who were clearly exhibiting a zero-defects hard attitude, NASA launched the Space Shuttle Challenger, a disaster which would prove to have been completely preventable. The Challenger disaster resulted from the failure of an O-ring, which was used to seal the joined sections of the solid rocket boosters, or SRBs. An O-ring's function is similar to the rubber gasket that seals the connection between the drain in your sink and the drain pipe to prevent leaks. Each solid rocket booster was constructed of six sections connected by three joints, which were welded at the factory and three joints which were sealed by the O-rings as the sections of the SRB were assembled at the Kennedy Space Center. The O-rings were required to contain the hot, high-pressure gases produced by the burning solid propellant inside each solid rocket booster, forcing it out the nozzle at the bottom of each rocket so that it would produce thrust instead of leaking out of the joined sections of the booster. The O-rings are installed according to the exacting specifications of a well-designed procedure with lists of options, actions, and details that must be followed with certainty to avoid a defect that would cause an O-ring to fail. The engineers responsible for designing, building, and assembling the SRBs knew that if hot burning gases leaked out of a joint in the sections of an SRB during a launch, it could cause a catastrophic explosion. Weather forecasts for the morning of January 28 were ominous, predicting an unusually cold morning with overnight lows near 18 degrees Fahrenheit and about 31 degrees Fahrenheit at launch time. This was at least 15 degrees Fahrenheit lower than any previous launch. As you can see from this actual photo of the morning of the launch, the forecast was fairly accurate. Those are icicles hanging from the safety rails, just inches from the solid rocket booster in the background. The engineers for every supporting process were troubled by the forecast of colder weather because of the way freezing temperatures affect the structural materials of the space shuttle. Things made of metal, rubber, and even plastic expand with heat and contract with the cold, sometimes beyond the limits of their design. This was a concern that had been shared by launch crews at the Space Center for decades. In particular, the material used to construct the O-rings contracts and becomes brittle as the temperature lowers, 
making it less supple and unable to seal the joints properly. The day before the launch, the engineers at Morton Thiokol, the contractor responsible for the construction and maintenance of the solid rocket boosters, warned NASA that they did not have enough data in their lists to prove that the joint would seal properly if the O-rings were colder than 53 degrees Fahrenheit, so they argued against launching. They also reminded NASA that the sum of all the external and internal materials of the SRB produced a catastrophic red line for the entire booster of 40 degrees Fahrenheit, below which a variety of possible failures could occur. Again, they recommended against a launch because it posed a threat to crew safety. The temperature at ground level at pad 39B at the launch was 36 degrees Fahrenheit and the argument between the Morton Thiokol engineers and NASA continued vehemently all the way through the launch countdown. NASA finally decided to launch in spite of the engineers' pleas and the information in their lists that had warned them against it. Seventy-three seconds into the flight of the Challenger, an O-ring failed. The root cause of this historic failure was not the O-ring, nor was it a lack of engineering skill or process management concepts. If the lists of information had been followed, the disaster would have been avoided. This was a failure of ethical restraint by NASA decision makers who had strayed far from their governing core values for safety. The dictionary defines ethics as the discipline dealing with what is good and bad and with moral duty and obligation. A person with a zero defects attitude and its inherent ethical restraint would not take an unreasoned risk that is contrary to the accumulated wisdom of a project list. I had an interesting discussion about the Challenger disaster with Philip Crosby. He had just returned from testifying at one of the hearings held following the incident. So I asked him what he had said. He said that his testimony had been very brief. He had simply told them that NASA had a requirement not to launch below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but they did, and that the time to rethink the requirements of the launch procedure was not during the launch countdown. It was clear and simple wisdom from a quality expert. There is really no secret to project management. It is entirely dependent upon clear, simple, and effective methods that will yield reliable results. That's why effective leaders always think process, and they always make lists.